Hey guys, how's it going? It's right here, and I am back today with another How Good Is video. Today it's going to be featuring our favorite slug. Can you guess who? Yes, it's going to be Abathur. Abathur is a unique hero, not just to Heroes of the Storm, but to any MOBA. He completely changed the landscape not only for the player playing Abathur, but for both teams as well. He's very reliant on draft, and you might have noticed that you haven't really seen him in your average game, but he is quite popular in competitive play, and that is because he functions much, much more effectively with a strong draft on specific maps with good coordination from your team. He's also one of two heroes in the game that are marked as very difficult by Blizzard. So he's going to be a big learning curve if you are new to playing him. Mechanically, he's not difficult to play, but knowing where you need to be and what you need to do is the learning curve for Abathur. Once you actually know how to play him, he's not that difficult, though. This Heroes like Medivh will still be a lot more mechanically difficult to play, even when you've learned how to play him. So, what does Abathur do? Well, he's kind of an omniscient presence throughout the map that split soaks while your team fights. And he can, he can provide benefits to team fights while doing so uh, and being on the other side of the map. He is classified as a global hero for several different reasons, but the main one is that he doesn't actually fight with his character model like every other hero does in the game. He fights indirectly through the use of his abilities and clones. So you can see that Abathur is already spawning locusts here to irritate me to no end, and they are spawning down the lane, have destroyed the front wall here, are now being attacked by the fort, which makes very irritating sounds. Let me refresh that. Let's go over his basic abilities, um, but the first thing you'll notice is that his Base health is extremely low. He has only 1,500 health at level 20. That is among the lowest in the game. I'm not actually sure who has lower health than him, but it is very, very low. He also has no mount, so he cannot mount throughout the map. You might be wondering, a global hero with no mount, how does that work? Well, if you press Z, you actually have a different ability called Deep Tunnel. You quickly tunnel to a visible location on the map. This means that you cannot tunnel to... You can see here, I can't tunnel to any of these locations, but I can tunnel anywhere to these locations. You can even tunnel behind the enemy's base or in their base if you have vision. And you can do that in several ways. One of them is Toxic Nest. So Toxic Nest is your W. It's a 10 second charge cooldown. And you spawn a mine that becomes active after a short delay, dealing damage and revealing the enemy for four seconds. It lasts 90 seconds and you can store up to three charges. You see that when I activate W, it spawns a grid format. And you can place these mines. You cannot place them on terrain, but you can place them in open areas. You also cannot stack them on top of each other, but you can place them in a short area around him, or around the area. <clears throat> you can spawn these maps anywhere, but there is um, a radius for it. I don't know if you can see the mini-map right now, but if you do look at the bottom right corner of the mini-map, you will see a very faint circle um, to indicate how far you can actually place the mines. I believe maybe if I move my screen all the way out here, you can see the very, very far radius of uh, his W. So it is not global, but it is very far. It's about the range of, if you're top lane on Cursed Hollow, you can mine about um, mid lane, or mid lane might be just about the maximum. So it's about half the map on most maps, maybe a third on bigger maps, uh, like Warhead Junction. So the point of mines is not to deal damage. The point of the mines is to scout out the enemy team, slow the rot rotations down, and set up ganks for your team. So there's a number of different ways you can play Abathur. It really depends on how your team is drafting him. I'll go over how, the different ways to play Abathur more in depth at the end of the video. But the TLDR is you can either have a comp built around assassination and going for picks and go, going for global strength and a split push. Uh, you can have a comp that's based around um, having a single target in team fights, And you can have a comp that's just based around um, a really strong four man and uh, you just kind of split with Abathur. But usually it's going to be you have a strong four man with Abathur, or you're looking for picks with Abathur, um, or you're having a global comp. Usually it's going to be one of those three styles, and the type of build you're going to take is going to greatly influence how that works. So again, his Ws, they can be used on minions, they can be used um, to damage things, but you generally want to use them in chokes where enemies are likely to walk, and they'll walk over them, reveal themselves, take damage, be dismounted, and slow rotations. Um, there's also talents that will greatly uh, help that help you with that goal as well. So you can place them right along here. Let's toggle cooldown so I can get a bunch of mines, and I'll refresh forts, and I'll toggle minions on. You can see that when I press the mines, they don't become active until they are in this glowing form. So when I actually press my W here, <coughs> you can see that the mines are 
taking damage over here. The mine doesn't act, the mine doesn't become active until after a short delay, and then once it does become active, um, it becomes invisible to the enemy team. So the enemy team cannot see these mines. If they are used, if someone like Tassadar uses his oracle to reveal vision, or if the mines take AOE damage. So let's say the KT throws his flame strike on one of them, it will destroy the mine. Or with oracle, it will reveal the mine. But the mines can also be attacked if they're in this form. They do not grant vision. You can see here until they become active but if someone does kill this mine in this form it will be granting vision but once it becomes active you can see in a short range around once it reveals the target it will grant more vision as well <clears throat> you can also see that abathur is missing one of his basic abilities and also i didn't show you deep tunnel so let me just show you that again you can dig anywhere in the map <clears throat> you cannot damage does not interrupt the tunnel but uh, if you're rooted or cc'd or anything like that it will stop tunnel so let's go over his rest of his basic abilities. Uh, symbiote is his Q, and it's a four second cooldown. You spawn and attach a symbiote to a target ally or structure while active avatar controls the symbiote, gaining access to new abilities. The symbiote is able to gain XP from nearby enemy deaths. Um, so enemy deaths ref refers to minions mostly, but you obviously do get it from heroes as well. well heroes just give global death, global XP. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. So you can basically cast symbiote, and this is a global, unlike uh, Toxic Nest, you can cast this to Anywhere on the map, on any structure, you can see that it casts even on the well. Once you cast on a target, you can see that this little uh, hat thing, which we're going to call it the hat from now on, uh, follows my cursor around. That doesn't matter. But you can also have access to new abilities. So new abilities are stab, which is a short uh, three-second cooldown, and you shoot a spike in the target direction that or the target area that deals damage to the first enemy it contacts. It also has two charges. Spike Burst is just your standard AoE damage. You activate it just by pressing W, and it does damage to your enemies. And Care Pace, Shield the Assisted Ally for 344, lasts for 8 seconds, cooldown 12 seconds. So my Q, my Stab just looks like this. I have two charges. My W looks like that. And my Care Pace just looks like this. Notice that when I end, even though it lasts for 8 seconds, once I end the duration of the ability, um, the shield disappears. Something else I want you to notice is if I spam all these abilities, notice the cooldowns right now. They're all on cooldown. And then I reactivate it, and then my W and my Q will be back up. My E shouldn't be back up, but my care pace does come back up. So what I'm saying is that all these abilities are refreshed when you read somebody out. So this means that you often don't want to keep hatting someone. Um, you want to refresh the hat. This will give you faster cooldowns. So if you're trying to do purely, purely do damage here, so if you're just doing Q, you're doing Q, the most optimal way is usually to Q here and then wait for this Q and W to pop up and then you can refresh it and you'll get the most efficient time out of your Q. Sometimes with your talents, you're going to want to, um, some of these talents will influence it so that you can, you want to hat permanently and, and not constantly cancel it. But I don't think that most of those talents are good. There's maybe one or two exceptions, uh, but most of those talents we won't be focusing on anyway. So, Again, constantly rehat targets during fights once you've used all of your charges on your abilities. Uh, it's generally unwise, like you don't want to be hatting someone for a straight 10 seconds. You're usually hatting them for like a, a few seconds at a time, and you're rehatting, repositioning, and then hatting again. Make sure that you, you're hatting constantly, though, throughout the entire game. It is your primary ability, and you're going to be doing it for like literally like 90% of the game, you'll just be hatting something or someone. The other thing is that. As you see in the ability, you can you can soak XP from this. So let's say that someone on your team isn't getting experience because they're not there, or that someone died in lane or something. Well, you can just, if the minions spawn here, you can just target the minion and you can get the experience of the nearby minions that are dying um, on the enemy team. So you see when these minions hit, and if I wasn't here, um, or no one was in this lane, you can just hat a minion here, and you can not only get the experience in the lane, but you can also push the lane as well. So you can see that I gain experience when I die. And Avatar's last basic ability is Locust Stream. It is a 15 second cooldown, and you can see this irritating thing just keeps spawning out and pushing these structures down, so I'm constantly refreshing forts. And it spawns a Locust to attack down the nearest lane every 15 seconds, and the Locust lasts for 25 seconds. And they do damage and have some health. So the purpose of these is to push down lanes and apply additional pressure for Abathur. Um, you can also hat these. So if you really need to hat something, you can hat these. These are stronger than your average minion. So not only does the minion wave have basically eight minions instead of seven, um, this locust is considerably stronger than your average minion. 
it also is something else that takes additional tower shots. You can see how many tower shots it takes without any talents put into it whatsoever. So if you toggle minions here, let's go back and look at abilities. So something that's very, very important in Abathur is called body soaking. And body soaking refers to using Abathur's actual body to soak. So you have two ways to soak um, minions. And soaking refers to just being near minions while they die. So you can hat a minion uh, while it's pushing, or you can be near uh, something. So a lot of new Abathur players will just be sitting in base because they're too afraid of dying because you can see how fragile Abathur actually is. His auto attacks do nothing. You basically use all of your abilities um, or symbiote to actually influence the game indirectly. A lot of Abathurs will sit behind their wall very very far away from the action even if the wave is pushed down and they will just hat uh, lanes or they'll just hat for push and this means two things. One, your locusts aren't doing much because they expire after they go a certain duration, especially on bigger maps, this is much more of a factor. Uh, and you aren't body soaking with Abathur. It is extremely important that to play Abathur effectively, you are body soaking with him. So you are near the minions with your body as they die. Now, you do not, you're not always able to do this, but if enemies are, if say the enemy team is five man contesting boss somewhere on the map, right? And you can uncurse hollow and they're all top man, they're all top doing boss. You can go bo bottom with your body dig bot and just soak that lane out and have no risk of dying whatsoever while the entire enemy team and your team is contesting top and that way the enemy team is forced to contest the boss very quickly and rushed otherwise you'll soak the experience um, in the additional lane um, at least one lane you can also soak two lanes at once just by being a body in one lane and, and hatting another lane uh, it's very easy to soak two lanes at once with abathur so a lot of time you'll want to have your team just roam around as four while you just solo, solo lane and soak it out. There's a lot of different strategies to playing Abathur. Sometimes you just all you want to do is just delay as long as possible, like if you have a Viking Scomp, to build up soak as long as possible until you get like a level advantage and then you just give the enemy team the objective. And then the key here playing Abathur is to hit late game. Late game Abathur is extremely irritating to deal with and is very strong. Key point is level 10 when you unlock your heroic ability. That makes Abathur much much stronger especially in team fights if you're playing him properly it's also a very common myth that stealth heroes counter abathur that is not true abathur in fact counters stealth heroes and that is because what do stealth heroes want to do zeratul and nova for example they want to and valyria i guess as well they want to roam around the map unseen and then look for individual picks but if Zeratul is constantly running into mines every like five seconds, constantly having to re-stealth and remount, your team is going to see him way before he gets anything done. So it's going to really, really um, <clears throat> discourage stealth heroes from rotating around the map. And I, I can't overstate this enough, you do not want to be using your mines to clear. Very, very rarely is it a situation where you'd want to put like a bunch of mines like this so that the minions walk over them and you clear the wave faster. You need to have map control. Um, by placing your mines all over the map in very important map objective points. You can slow uh, enemy teams from rotating so that you can uh, soak faster, delay longer. All these little things really, really add up with Abathur. Abathur should by far have, be having the most soak on his team by like two or three times as much. And by soak, I mean uh, this last tab here where it says XP contribution. You should have way more than the rest of your team. Okay, so let's actually go over Abathur's talents now that we've covered most of that. Other thing is that you want to be hatting the uh, melee hero on your team or the frontline, the tank, or the melee assassin, and you do not want to be hatting the range carry most of the time. Like hatting a Jaina is not going to do much. You want to be hatting the frontline hero because if you look here, uh, most of your abilities are very short range, right? So your stab, this is the max range for your stab. And your W, that's the max range. So you have to be very, very close to the enemy team to actually gain a lot of benefit from these talents. So let's actually go over uh, <clears throat> his talent build. So like I said, there's a multiple, there's multiple different talent builds that you can go with Abathur. The build, the only build that I really think isn't viable at all is E-Build. And it's because it was nerfed recently, because it was kind of bugged, so it was stronger than intended. But I don't think that the E-Build is, is, is better than the other builds that you could provide for your team. So I don't think it's bad, but I think the other builds are better. So this build, so if you take this talent, this talent, and this talent, and something else about Abathur is that a lot of his talents uh, are, <clears throat> a lot of his talents synergize with other talents. So if you go one type of build, you're usually going one type of build through most of his talent tiers. It's not like you just take the best talent at each tier for Abathur. You're, you have to actually synergize with the rest of the talents that you do take. Because a lot of his talents will synergize, maybe not until like later in the game, until like level 16. 
Um, but for example, his level one talent synergizes very well with his 13 and 16 talents. Um, but you won't gain much benefit until then. So I don't, I won't be focusing on that, um, on that specific build. Okay, let's actually go over his basic, uh, his his talents. So pressurized glands is level one, and increases the range of symbiote spike burst by 25%, decreases the cooldown by one. Again, spike burst is his W, so that's spike burst. Also, I wanted to note that <clears throat> you notice that when I hat a larger structure, the spike burst is actually larger. Uh, and that's because the spike burst is a radius outside of the outlying circle. So um, this structure takes up all of this area. So the spike burst is actually going to be a flat amount after that. So if I go back and I look at it and I hat uh, this, which counts as a hero, you see the spike burst. This is the this is the actual area around the, the unit that you're hatting. And then it's only going to do a flat amount after that, a flat distance. Survival Instincts increases Locust Health by 50% and the Duration by 40%, so these annoying things will push even harder. This is especially important for bigger maps and longer lanes, especially later in the game. <clears throat> Regenerative Microbes, Symbiote's Carrot Pace, heals the target for 149 health per second, or just a large amount of health per second over 4 seconds. And then Venom Nest, Toxic Nest, deals 75% more damage over 3 seconds. So This does not stack, so if you have 3 mines in a row here, enemy walks over all 3. Um, the 75% additional damage is basically just a dot that's applied after, so it'll be reapplied when you walk over additional mines. So, what talent should you take here? Well, it depends on what build you're going to be going, it depends on what map you're doing. So, <clears throat> there's three common really there's three really types of common builds. The first build is split push build, the second build is mine build, and the third build is hat build. So there's two types of hat builds. One of them is focusing on your W which is the pressurized glands. The other one is focusing on your E, which is regenerative microbes. And I do not recommend this build, so I'm going to be focusing on the this hat build, which is pressurized glands. So if you have a hard carry, like an Illidan uh, or a Tracer, um, sometimes even a Zeratul, uh, but usually it's a, it's a hard carry, so something that's going to stay in the fight for a lengthy period of time. You can also do this with double tank. Some tanks are really, really work really, really well with Abathur, so Arthas works really well with Abathur. Uh, Muradin is probably the best tank that works with Abathur, uh, especially once you hit late game. So this is a build where you're sustaining in fights, like you're going to be hatting throughout most of the fight. So heroes like Genji, heroes like uh, Zeratul, you probably aren't hatting for most of the fight. You're probably going to be cloning, which is a level 10 ability, um, or doing something else in the map, or you're hatting in short bursts. So you don't hat for sustain. So the other build is a split push build, which would focus on survival instincts. And the other build is mine build, which just focuses on mines and map presence. So if you're going, if you have a hard carry like an Illidan, um, like a Tracer or something like that, or maybe you're going double tank with Abathur, then you want to get pressurized glands because your build is based around Abathur winning team fights for you. If your build is around split pushing the map, you want to go survival instincts. And if your build is around getting picks mostly, so like a Zeratul um, or a Genji or a Slow Rotations or you have kind of a CC comp, then you want to go in Venom Nests. So if, you're, if your compas are based around map control in Venom Nest, um, if you're split pushing, survival instincts, and if you're team fighting, pressured glens. <clears throat> and these talents translate to what you get the later talent tiers as well. So let's go. I think super standard is just going survival instincts here. Level 4, we have Prolific Dispersal, reduces the cooldown of Toxic Nest by 2 seconds and adds 2 additional charges, so the cooldown is reduced from 10 to 8, and the charges immediately can store this from 3 to 5. Blissosphere, or Blissospores, Toxic Nest range is, is increased to global, and the duration is increased to by 25%. So this can be really good on big maps, where if you're going mine build and you, just, um, you aren't able to create map pressure everywhere, maybe they have some kind of hero that's stopping you from body soaking as well, so you can't be everywhere at the same time. It might be safer just to use my global mines. Sustained carapace increases the shield amount of carapace by 40% allows it to persist after symbiote ends. So this is again the e-builds, which I don't recommend. And then an adrenal overload. So heroic symbiote hosts gain 20, 25% additional attack speed. So again, this is really, really good with like an Illidan, who's going to be sustained in a fight. It's also really good with a Muradin. Uh, think Skullcracker, think Give him the Axe, uh, and think uh, Battle Momentum at level 7. It's going to be very, very strong with that kind of build. So if you go Mines at level 1, if you go in Venom Nest here, uh, you're going to want to be going Prolific Dispersal or Ballista Spears. If you went Survival Instincts, you're going to want to be going um, probably Prolific Dispersal, again, maybe Ballista Spores. 
And if you want pressurized glands, you're probably going to want to go adrenal overload. So since I went survival instincts, I'm going to go prolific dispersal. At level 7, we have needle spine, increases the damage and range of symbiote stab by 20%. File nest, toxic nest, slow enemy movement speed by 40% for 2.5 seconds. Network carapace, using symbiote's carapace all supplies on talented carapace shields to all nearby enemy heroes, minions, and mercenaries. And call down mule. 30, it's a 60 second cooldown, you activate to call down a mule that repairs the structure one at a time. Near target point for 40 seconds, healing for 100 health every one second, and he grants one ammo every three seconds as well. So if you went hat build at level one, so pressurized glands, and you went adrenal overload, you're probably going to do it on needle spine or mule. If you went uh, in venom nest, you're going to go vile nest most likely, vile nest or mule. And then if you went um, pre survival instincts, you most likely want to go mule because you're split pushing and, and trying to out macro them. Um, or you'll go vile nest, especially if you went prolific dispersal at level four. So let's actually talk about these talents. Needle Spine is just going to give you more DPS, which is why it's better for half build. Vile Nest is better for mines because you have more mines in availability at level 4. And if you got level 1, this is, makes them stronger as well. Um, basically, mines just will completely shut down rotations on the enemy team. Especially if you're mining up a specific choke, they will just not be able to rotate through there. They will be constantly stopped by mines. Really, really good on rotation, um, on larger rotation maps where they're rotating across the map, maybe like Towers of Doom or uh, Cursed Hollow. Um, even on small maps, this is really, really good as well because they're constantly hitting mines. <laughs> and then Mule is going to be very situational, but also very good on specific maps. So sp specifically, it's very, very, very strong on Blackheart's Bay and Sky Temple. You see that uh, you'll see a lot of Mules on Sky Temple in competitive play. Um, Blackheart's Bay just isn't played. But I think Blackheart's Bay for the first cannon shots is going to take your one of your, it's going to take your midfort down to like 20%, assuming your towers don't die. You'll be able to mule that all back up. And say on um, Sky Temple, if your fork is really low, you can just mule it back up. And then your forts and your structures will act as sponges to just take. You can trade. You can literally trade temple to the enemy team and then just mule the forts back up. And you'll be able to. Um, like out macro them late game because even though you're trading a fort for a fort, um, you're actually muling up one of your forts so you don't lose the fort entirely. And that's very, very strong. So if you're on Sky Temple or Blackheart's Bay, uh, take a heavy look at mule, but otherwise um, take the builds that I recommended there. Since I went Survival Instincts and I went Prolific Dispersal, I'm going to go Mines at 7. Level 10, we have Ultimate Evolution. It is a 15 second cooldown, or 50 second cooldown. You clone an allied target hero and control it for 20 seconds. Avatar has perfected the clone, granting a 20% um, additional spell power and attack damage and 10% bonus movement speed. Cannot use their heroic ability. So, this is a very unique ability and it's a very low cooldown. So, if we toggle minions here, I actually have to turn an allied hero on. So, I made a video already um, on Abathur and then I cloned this. Because I wanted to see what would happen, because that counts as a hero, and it bugged my thing outside to start again. So let's look what happens when I clone an Alrak. You can target a hero anywhere on the map, and Abathur disappears on the map, and you can turn into the hero that you've cloned. And the hero functions exactly the same. You can mount as normal, you can combo, and you can use all of your abilities, and they all do 20% more damage. Also, notice here, this is very difficult to see, but you can see that there's a slight kind of purpley residue, and this is visible to not only your team, but the enemy team as well. So if they're looking carefully, they can actually spot you out. So how you want to play this clone is you want to um, just basically suicide and do as much damage as possible. You usually want to clone the highest damage hero on your team. Uh, let's turn the heroes off there. So really good clones, for example, are like a Vala or um, a Zeratul or a Genji. Um, even like an Arthas is really, really strong. Arthas does a lot of damage. Uh, and you usually don't want to clone the support though. You don't want to clone like a Johanna. You usually want to clone a high sustained damage hero or a burst hero. Depends what your comp is built around. If you have a Zeratul, you're probably going to go burst someone down with double Zeratul. If you have an Arthas, um, your comp might be... If, double, if you have like a double tank with Arthas, your comp might be more sustained. So you just want to use Arthas to just um, mess around with their backline. They have to peel. Killing the clone does grant some XP to the enemy team. I believe it's 25% of a hero kill. I'm not sure. But only if the, the clone is actually killed. And there's a lot of other really, really good clones as well. Greyman clone in particular is very, very strong. And you don't have to clone just for team fights. You can also clone um, for... If you're trying to burst down a structure, if you're trying to do boss, the cooldown is very, very low. But note that the cooldown does not start. The 50 second cooldown does not start until the clone dies. So 
since it lasts 20 seconds from the start of the time you actually clone the hero if it lasts full duration it's gonna be 70 seconds until you cast your next clone so keep that in mind you can also do um backdoor core or something with like double zero tool or double um gray main or something or look for a keep or you can just finish off stuff there's a multitude of uses you can use for clone and this is absolutely the target or the, the heroic ability that I would recommend for level 10 if you're playing Abathur. I do not recommend going the other heroic, and even though I will showcase it here, again, I think you must go this heroic if you are playing Abathur. If you're playing Abathur and you're going Monstrosity, I think you are useless. Uh, I, I've seen some people use it, and I've won some games having a Monstrosity in my team, but it is just never more effective than having an, uh, uh, the clone on your team. The clone actually lets you win team fights. If you don't have clone in your team fight, it's basically a 4v5 for your team for most of the game. And your team has to play very, very carefully. You need the clone to be able to make the team fight 5v5. You need the clone. <clears throat> you can go a build with Monstrosity where you had it and you go like Carapace build and you just pull it around the map everywhere, but not only do you have significantly less presence in team fights, and please don't tell me you're bringing the monstrosity into the middle of the team fight. Um, you could be having a hero throughout the entire time. You could be body soaking because if you're controlling the monstrosity, as I'll show you in a moment, uh, you have to actually be having it the entire duration. Uh, otherwise, it'll just do its own thing. So let's go over uh, monstrosity. So you, monstrosity reads 90 second cooldown. Turn an allied minion or locust into a monstrosity when enemy minions. Near the monstrosity, die it gains 5% health and 5% basic attack damage. Second up to 40 times, the monstrosity takes 60% less damage from non heroic enemies. So, non heroic is again anything that's not a hero. And using Symbiote on, monstr on the monstrosity allows Avatar to control it in addition to Symbiote's number of benefits. The ability can be reactivated to automatically cast Symbiote on his monstrosity. Okay, so let's refresh forts. Let's toggle minions on here. Again, you can also clone. So, you can clone any of these minions here. Or you could target any of these minions or your locust. So I'm going to target uh, this wizard minion. You can see that a wizard minion dies. And then I'm not controlling this uh, at all right now. The monstrosity activates. And I can also hat the monstrosity. So basically I just control it like I would a normal hero. You can stutter step with it and everything. And you can cast your basic abilities with it as well. So yes, this is very fun to use. But again, I just don't think it's more useful. If you stop hatting it, it's just going to go push down the nearest lane. So a lot of times you'll want to take it out of a fight, heal it up with your hat when you go carapace build um, because a lot of your abilities do affect it and you'll want to do stuff. Keep in mind that this um, I don't believe this counts as uh, auto attacks. I believe these counts as, like it'll be blocked by parry but I don't believe uh, block charges will stop the attacks from monstrosity. So um, yeah, that's a thing. But again, I just wouldn't really recommend that you use uh, Monstrosity. Well, that's going to not disappear, is it? Okay, hopefully it'll die there. All right, so let's go into the rest of the talents. So we have Assault Strain at level, tw level 13. We have Bombard Strain, Spatial Efficiency, and Soma Transference. Transference. Uh, assault Strain, Locust Basic Attacks Cleave for 50% damage and Explode on Death for an amount. Bombard Strain, Locust Basic Attacks become Long Range Siege Attack that deals 70% more damage. Spatial Efficiency, uh, Surveil to Stab gains one additional charge and its cooldown is reduced by 0.5 seconds. And Soma Transference, uh, Symbiote sp Spike Burst heals the host for 140 health per enemy hero hit. <clears throat> okay, so these two talents are basically the exact same. I don't know why Blizzard actually has both of these talents because they fulfill the same role. They split push harder. But Bombard Strain is just going to be straight up better than Assault Strain. I don't actually understand the purpose of this talent at all. It should just be removed. So Bombard Strain, again, so if you go uh, Survival Instincts at 1 here, Prolific Dispersal, and you go you basically go this at 1, you're going to want to be going um, the Bombard Strain at level 13. And then if you went uh, Hat Build, so you went Pressurized Glands, and then you went Adrenal Overload, you're going to want to be going Soma Transference at 13. So Spatial efficiency, just not good. I uh, don't think, you, again, you're going to want to be rehatting very often. So, and, I, and the heal is very, very effective. Say Illidan jumps in the middle of the team fight and you have the bigger AoE for your W, and you can just heal um, like six, 700 every like four seconds. So it's going to be very, very, very strong for whoever you're hatting in that situation. So, one of those two talents, but Bard Strain or Soma Transference. 
At level 16, we have Envenom Spikes. Abathur's Symbiote Spike Burst also slows enemy movement speed by 40% for 2 seconds. Adrenal Boost. Symbiote's Carapace increases the movement speed of the target by 40% for 3.5 seconds. Locust Brood. Uh, activate to spawn 3 Locusts at a nearby location. And Volatile Mutation. Ultimate uh, Evolution Clones and Monstrosity. Deal 312 damage to nearby enemies every 3 seconds and when they die. So... I think this is just bad um, at level 16. I've never seen anyone take this uh, or have any success with it. And then you have these three talents remaining. So again, if you went Locust to level 1 and Locust to 13, you're definitely going to go Locust Brood at uh, 16. I'll just take it here to show what it looks like. So you can now activate Locust Brood. So very, very often you'll want to, like, I'll toggle cooldowns here. You'll want to dig to a location, spawn your Locusts, and then leave or go to a safe spot, and your Locust will push down the lane very, very effectively. Unfortunately, they'll probably kill this whole wall here, maybe. Okay, so <clears throat> that's really good if you're going split push build. And then if you're going half build, you're going to either want to go Envenomed or Adrenaline. So if you have like an Illidan um, or a Zeratul or something like that, you want to go Envenomed to slow them. Then if you have like an Arthas who's already going to slow their whole team, you might want to go Adrenaline Boost. But most of the time, you want to go Envenomed Spikes. At level 20, we have Evolutionary Link. As long as the ultimate evolution is live, the original target of the clone gains a shield with 25% of their max health. Also, re refreshes the duration every 5 seconds. Evolution complete. <clears throat> Monstrosity gains the ability to deep tunnel to any visible location once every 25 seconds. Hive Mind Symbiote creates an additional uh, symbiote on a nearby allied hero. The symbiote mimics the command of the first, but is half the damage and shielding. And Locust Nest, you can activate to create a nest that periodically spawns Locust. Only one Locust Nest can be active at a time. So if you go Locust Nest, um, you want to make sure that you... If you go Locust Nest, um, if you go Locust Build, sorry, you want to go Locust Nest at level 20. So then you can see how the split push build becomes very, very strong. So you basically, you can see that this whole, fort, the whole wall died. You dig to the target location, uh, if I have vision here. And then you would just spawn all of your Locust and your Locust Nest, and then you would just leave. And the enemy team would have to deal with this because this will absolutely push down the lane enough. Not It's not that these locusts will necessarily uh, kill the thing by itself, but they'll kill all the minions and then create a huge minion wave here, as you can see, um, that will definitely destroy keeps and forts like him. You have to deal with this like him, and it's very irritating to deal with. Uh, if you lose fights against an Abathur going this build, uh, you probably just lose the game because uh, his split push will just get so much value. The other build you can go is, uh, so if you for some reason did go Evolved Monstrosity, then I would say go Evolution Complete, because you can dig tunnel in the middle of a fight, which is really, really strong. Um, it actually gives you some kind of team fight presence at 20. Um, and then Hive Mind is really good if you're doing, the, again, the more sustainy fights. So um, if you're doing a more sustainy oriented fight, Symbiote can have two targets. This is really, really strong. Um, even though it only does half as much damage, it's still 50% more damage. Um, and if you have um, something like Soma Transference or Adrenal Overload, this increases the attack speed, this heals. Those will do. Those will still do full 25% attack speed and the full heal at level 13. And the level 16 will still slow, so you still get a value, full value. Um, and this just automatically hats a nearby allied hero when you have High Mind available. The other talent that I don't really see anyone taking is Evolutionary Link, and I do think it has some value. Um, I just don't see it being picked at all. If you have like a hyper carry or something, um, or even like a Zeratul or something, if 25% of their max health is a shield every five seconds, it's very, very strong. And I think that uh, it's really, really underlooked. If you're going for a clone build where you're just relying on a clone to win you fights, I think this is the build to go. But if your clone isn't able to win fights, maybe you don't have a good clone target or something, then I think Hive Mind is going to give you the best bane for your buck late game. So this was a really long video, guys. I appreciate you sticking through it. And... Um, I hope you learned something. I think the takeaway for Abathur is that there's a lot for you to learn, and he's going to have a steep learning curve when you first start playing. But the key takeaways are always try to body soak as long as you aren't dying. Always try to um, be getting soak with your hat. Always be doing something with your hat at all times. Um, make sure you're, you're mining choke points. You're mining across the map to have map pressure. Make sure you identify what build you want to go. Talk to your team about how you want to play with Abathur, especially if you're playing with a more coordinated team. And when you're cloning in fights, um, make sure you're picking your clone wisely. It should be a DPS clone. And uh, it depends on how you want to win team fights. But if you're going for more of a burst build, then you obviously want to clone more of a bursty hero. Sometimes like double Jaina can be good as well. It's not that you always want to clone 
a ra you don't want to clone a range hero. Like for example, again, double Jane is really good because the Blizzard um, or the Frost works off of each other, so they can slow for each other for it to benefit from their own passives. And um, make sure you clone as often as you can as well, because it's it's a very very low cooldown, especially if your clone is dying quickly. It's only gonna be like a 50 second cooldown, so it's gonna be very 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 efficient for you late game. Hope you enjoyed the video, guys. Until next time, I'll talk to you then.